Uh, so my name is Wolfgang Trailer. I'm from uh, Germany and I currently work in Frankfurt uh, at the Sinkenberg Institute. Uh, I'm a trained biologist and I've only self-taught myself a little bit of statistics. So I feel very honored to speak uh, with statisticians here and please uh, correct me if I do any, anything um, wrong. I uh, come from a background where uh, we do uh, very mechanistic, uh, very detailed uh, ecosystem models, and I have appreciated the Beijing perspective on that, which I will introduce you. So, I think we have to say oh, it's the same problem. Yeah. No, it was just not So, uh, my outline is simple. I uh, will first introduce uh, a base, uh, some basic concepts of mechanistic versus phenomenological models, then zoom in into uh, my work I did uh, for uh, my PhD, which will hopefully be submitted sometime soon. And then I will zoom out again and I try to generalize um, into some kind of workflow for predictive mechanistic modeling in ecology. Yeah, I will start with the quote um, by Hu Lahan uh, two, in uh, 2017, uh, who thought about prediction in ecology specifically. And they say, prediction is the only way to demonstrate scientific understanding. Models are where ecological understanding is stored, and they are the source of all predictions. No prediction is possible without a model of the world. Exactly there is where we want to go with mechanistic models. So, the way I understand, uh, I use the term mechanistic models, is that we have a bottom-up understanding of uh, the whole, in this case, some kind of ecosystem or populations of organisms, and uh, we uh, represent this by the sum of the parts. So it's in, in a way, it's a reductionist uh, perspective where uh, we have many different uh, parts, say um, reproduction, uh, feeding, uh, predation, etc. cetera, that then um, uh, bring in emerging ecosystem property, for example, uh, the dynamics over time of the population. On the other side, we have phenomenological models or correlative models and statistical models, and uh, they uh, follow a top-down approach uh, where we have quantity of interest um, uh, that is then uh, used to fit the model, um, and for example, a general, generalized linear model uh, in order to predict it um, for uh, uh, new environments. And of course, both uh, need some kind of uh, predictor variables. So I'm uh, interested uh, in my work in predicting into neural analog situations, so something outside of the domain of a training. And I consider model predictions in this sense as computational experiments. And uh, we can talk a, bit, a little bit about the philosophy of science there, whether we uh, consider this as uh, um, uh, evidence that is gathered by uh, simulations. Um, but in general, I follow a, a mindset of, of treating computational experiments just like ordinary experiments and apply the same kind of uh, rigor and epistemology to it. So um, when we want to uh, predict into no analog space, that could mean, for example, in the future under climate change scenarios, or well, in my case, because I have worked in the, uh, in the past as a paleo ecologist, uh, many thousands of years um, into the past. And uh, here the mechanistic models shine because they can, um, even if there is no direct analog in uh, our modern world, still represent anal analogous mechanisms um, that uh, we will find uh, in current uh, situations as we find them in past or future situations. So now to my case study, I have uh, uh, um, dealt with the mammoth step of uh, Eurasia. So we are going back um, 12,000 uh, to 20,000 years uh, ago and uh, look at the 
huge uh, steppe vegetation ecosystem uh, that spanned all Eurasia in the last ice age. And here we have many animals that are now extinct, uh, mammoths, bison, uh, horses, etc., in uh, a very unique assemblage uh, that doesn't have an analog, an analog um, nowadays. This Ice Age giant shaped the environment. Uh, they trampled, they uh, fed on the vegetation, and uh, they did nutrient cycling, and thereby changed the ecosystem. Perhaps even maintained their own uh, uh, ecosystem uh, of uh, steppe vegetation by keeping away tundra and uh, forest. And this only works uh, this theory if there are actually enough of these large herbivores. That's why I'm interested in simulating their densities. They use a Bayesian approach, um, trying to narrow down the space um, or the range of plausible megafauna densities in the numbers. Here is my uh, model setup. Uh, I use, uh, um, I developed a, a megafauna model called the modular megafauna model. MMM, and uh, parameterized it uh, for the woolly mammoth. And this is coupled uh, with a dynamic uh, vegetation model uh, called LPG. I guess it was already mentioned earlier um, uh, with a, uh, in the pollen talk. So uh, LPG guess uh, takes uh, uh, climate uh, uh, data and uh, vegetation parameters and uh, the simulate net primary production. So that is basically the forage from the grazer, grazers. And uh, this all works in a dynamic uh, way. So we have daily time steps, we have daily uh, food intake, we have uh, uh, reproduction on an annual and a seasonal scale, and we have starvation. And all uh, that, um, I, I don't want to go into all the details here, but all that uh, scales up from uh, the individual level processes to population level processes, so that the um, uh, Megafauna density that I'm interested in is an emergent property from these lower level mechanisms. And the way usually we, we do, usually do models is uh, uh, we piece all these things together that we think uh, might work in the ecosystem, reproduction, feeding, etc. And then uh, we parameterize them uh, with uh, perhaps. Uh, 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 values from the literature or with some good guesses of what works and we look what uh, is our outcome and then we see how uh, we have to tune the model in order to get better outcomes etc so it's a very uh, unknown formal very uh, intuitive uh, tuning process and i want to bring in more formalism there and especially uncertainty analysis which is uh, crucially lacking in my field so um what i did and it was painstaking work uh, was to rewrite uh, this megafauna model um, uh, in a way that all parameters had actual biological meaning. And uh, so that I could find literature values for each of these parameters, and I set a minimum and a maximum for each parameter. So these uh, are then my priors. And it was actually a dynamic uh, uh, evolution of my learning because I had no idea of Bayesian statistics when I started this. And then I came across it and I found, wow, this is the way. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it really helped me. Um, uh, but I had one problem. Um, I saw it here it's on the left side my uh, parameter priors, you know, I had minimum, maximum, and I just put a, a beta distribution um, on top of that. Um, uh, the way uh, this model works is uh, I, I start with a, a set of uh, parameter values, it runs, and it gives one output of a mean population density. Um, how do I make a probabilistic model out of that? And how do I fit into data? What kind of data actually? Because <laughs> I don't know anything about mammoth population. That's the exact thing that I wanted to fix. Um, so basically, uh, we have not a, a probabilistic model as we usually have with, with some kind of uh, nice likelihood function, but I have uh, basically a point estimate. Um, and I want to get uh, to the top right here to have some kind of posterior population density. So I can do that. Um, the way I did this was uh, um, 
by uh, looking at the climatic niche of the model uh, of, of the mammoths um, or of the mammoth step. So we have uh, an idea of under which conditions uh, these mammoths must have uh, lived, um, a dry and cold, continental climate, etc. Um, and then I, I look at uh, today's uh, climate and, and uh, just pick some uh, grid cells here um, uh, from, from a global map that uh, represent uh, the um, climatic uh, uh, niche, uh, roughly. And uh, then um, I uh, define my likelihood function in a way that I optimize the model, or I, I fit the model to um, have mammoth populations survive in all, under all of these conditions. So the uh, more grid cells, which you see here at the bottom, um, have viable populations that actually survive over a long time, um, the higher is my likelihood. So it's just the proportion of grid cells with viable populations. Mm -hmm. And here you see a typical simulation. So I, I, I just have uh, um, mammoth populations over time, and then I take a mean and, and see how, uh, 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 what value that takes. So the cool thing here is that I uh, um, have no top down. Uh, fitting on top down calibration, but I only have uh, uh, the uh, absence presence. I know that the mammoths were there, but I don't know. Them. But this is what the model tells me. So here are my results. Um, now, uh, with ecologists, I could have a beautiful debate about all the ecological details that I have and have not in the model, etc., etc. I will keep this simple. Um, uh, so uh, the um, optimistic uh, paleoecologists say, yeah, there were very, very many megafauna and uh, populations were 100 plus uh, kilograms per hectare. Um, and uh, more conservative uh, uh, paleoecologists say it was much lower. And my um, uh, posterior probability distribution is somewhere in between, they are rather on the lower side. So uh, this uh, lends uh, some doubt, or could some doubt on these very high principles. That's basically my ecological result. We also have posterior probability distributions for um, all parameters, and this is cool because they uh, are biologically meaningful. And for example, here we see um, the dotted or the dashed prior and the um, histogram of the posterior. Posterior shows uh, mammoths uh, couldn't take any more than 5% uh, mortality rate annually. And this is the threshold for. Um, uh, uh, human hunting tolerance, for example, mm -hmm. uh, informative. What comes out of this, uh, uh, out of these different uh, mechanistic um, parts? So, what I've learned from this is predictions are cool, but we need to be really careful with them uh, because. Um, oftentimes, uh, in my field, we just run the models. And then see what comes out of it. And if it doesn't make sense, then you change the model. <laughs> okay, this is kind of science, yes. Uh, but uh, I uh, want to approach it in a more diligent way and uh, uh, take inspiration from actual uh, uh, ordinary experiments. So I have come to the conclusion that for this specific application of uh, um, uh, evasion methods, I uh, consider, uh, I, I make a cut um, between model development and model application. That is actually running the, uh, 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 running the computational experiment and doing um, predictions. Thank you. So um, this uh, fits uh, nicely uh, in the frame of uh, Bayes' theorem that we have some kind of uh, 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 that one part that is before the experiment, that is, uh, we have the priors uh, and the model. Um, and uh, then the D, the data, uh, whatever new information comes in, um, is the uh, pivot that brings in. Uh, that brings us then to the uh, prediction, the posterior um, probability distributions. The pre-registration is something that I've thought a lot about, and I have uh, tried to apply it to model development, and I found that it doesn't really work, um, because model development is too much of an exploratory uh, process. 
still, I think it's valuable. And that's why I uh, have this in two parts here. Um, I, I develop the model, I define priors, I do prior predictive checks, and I uh, see how generalizable the model is, for example, with cross-validation on some kind of uh, 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 already known data set, and then change the model, etc. cetera. Um, and by that, I establish the justification that my model represents accurately the target system that I want to create. That's the purpose of model development. Then I do a blind preparation uh, that just te technically everything uh, works. So I, I, I uh, use some uh, nonsense data, for example, before I, uh, I use the real data um, in order to run the predictions. Okay. Conclusions. I have thought a lot about philosophy of science in this context, and I'm still not really clear. And I wrote a whole chapter in my dissertation. <laughs> it's, it's really difficult. Um, so I would love to have some discussions in the pub later or so. Um, uh, but I, for me, uh, the Bayesian approach already helps a lot and brings me in the right direction. Um, I think uh, we can learn a lot uh, from the statistical uh, model community um, because they have a lot of rigor and we have uh, the mechanistic understanding. Um, and uh, the beauty of uh, our complex models is that they constrain themselves through the mechanism and through the biologically meaningful price that we can actually find a priori. Uh, we have the self constrained uh, distribution uh, or a self constrained model. Um, it doesn't need any top-down uh, calibration. And uh, my community is investing a lot of uh, computing power, new mechanisms, more resolution, etc. I think we are, are better off by, by uh, actually uh, uh, using that computational speed uh, for Bayesian analysis. <laughs> Um, so uh, I want to thank all my uh, uh, collaborators, uh, my institute, and some funding from GROC, and uh, thank you for your attention.